Namaskar. I am very happy to be part of this session of this knowledge yagya which is taking place. It's a very big effort which has been made to disseminate the knowledge systems of India or rather what is called the Prachin Vidya of India which is so essential to be fully understood in the present times. Now I am going to begin with a Mangala Charan Ganga Taranga Ramaniya Jata Kalapam Gauri Nirantar Vibhushit Vama Bhagam Narayana Priyamananga Madapaharam Varanasi Purapatim Bhaja Vishwanatham Varanasi Purapatim Bhaja Vishwanatham It is only appropriate that when we talk of the Natya Shastra that we remember <coughs> Shiva or Nataraj because he is the one who gave the very science of uh, Natya to be performed with all the Angharas and beautiful things on the stage. The Natya Shastra, of course, as you know, is supposed to be created as Natya Ved by Brahma and given to Bharat Muni. Now, because time is limited and I propose to talk for about, uh, say, 45 minutes only and then invite questions from you and then give you detailed answers to the questions and thus make my time till 3.30. So what I will do is to first present to you what are the essential ideas of Natya Shastra. And then I'll briefly comment as to how Natya Shastra is relevant, is useful, and how it can be used even today for performing new kinds of genres new kinds of acting, new kinds of song, music, dance, and a practice of various so-called performing arts, how it can be useful even now. Because a Shastra, as has been said, is not for just one time. A Shastra is for all times, times that have been and times that are to come. It is something that uh, guides us, inspires us in a particular area of knowledge. And in this case, it is the area of performance. Now, as a prolegomena to my subject, which is the content of the Natya Shastra or the essential ideas of the Natya Shastra, I will say a couple of things. I will make a distinction between what we are normally taught as theater. You see, whether it is a school, say class fifth or sixth, or it is uh, first year of college, or it is uh, a higher level, a PhD course, when somebody asks a question, what is theater? What is drama? then the answer given largely is based, the answer given is largely based on uh, the Greek notions of what used to be drama. Because the Europeans inherited what was drama, the notions of drama, from the Greeks. As you know that European drama 
began sometime towards the end of 16th century. There was no drama before that because Christianity did not allow much theater unless that theater told a very, uh, a very simple biblical story or a story about the life of Christ or something out of the Christian mythology. So there was nothing what we call cosmic drama or drama on uh, a large number of human subjects. So uh, in Europe, drama in say 11th, 12th century uh, had become uh, nothing more than what was called morality plays. So it was revived in the 16th century. And in trying to do that, they drew upon the ancient Greeks. And then they said, okay, we belong to the Greek tradition. We follow that tradition and this is Western drama. So they created a whole uh, construct which was false, which was not part of their culture, but which was acquired from the Greeks because uh, people in Europe had hardly any direct connection with Greece, except through Christianity. And Christianity itself had put an end to ancient theater and drama in Greece, because they said that theater is uh, not a morally correct art. It is something immoral because it uh, is based upon deceit. And so this revival took place in England and France and later on in Germany. And then this European drama came to the colonies. It came to India and we thought of all of it as Western drama. And so we had this fundamental notion of what is Greek drama as European drama and drama as a universal art was defined for us by the Europeans. So today in schools and colleges, when the question is asked, what is drama? The answer is not according to what was the Indian tradition of drama, but what is the Western tradition? Now in this Western tradition, there are three main things. <coughs> there is the story, then there is a character, a hero, who projects what is highly admirable or good. And then there is a discussion about the social utility of drama or what is being tell, told as a story, what is the philosophic content of the story. So these are the three things basically, uh, which go back to the Greek tradition which is the uh, called as muthos, ethos, and the anion. So these three things were defined, thought content, character, and story or plot. And this is drama for us. For the ancient Greeks, there were three other things. There was uh, spectacle, there was music, and there was high poetic content. But European drama, uh, more or less dispensed with these things. It totally dispensed with music. It had a little bit of spectacle and some bit of literary rhetoric. After a while, poetry disappeared from European drama. So this is what is taught to us. Now, Indian drama or Natya Shastra takes a much wider view of what is theater. So what is then the Indian view or the Natya Shastra view of the content of the fundamental notions that make up drama? What is theater? If that question is asked to somebody who is steeped in the uh, ancient tradition, theatrical tradition of India, then how would he answer? And where would he get that answer? And where would he draw upon 
what is the text which would uh, tell him about it? Obviously, the text is Natya Shastra, because Natya Shastra lays down the very fundamental principle. It does it as early as 2500 uh, years ago, that is around 500 BC. The present text of Natya Shastra had been already kind of compiled, written, rewritten, and made into a very almost a definitive recension. So, how did Bharat Muni look upon theater? And what did he say is theater? Here, there is one thing very important to remember. You see, as compared to theater of any other country, India is almost a continent. So British drama is uh, confined to England, or rather just south of England. German drama later on developed very late, again to a small region. So, so similarly French drama. And in the 19th century, when some of the modern nations like Norway, from where Ibsen came, uh, all these plays were written. These were small countries, but India was very huge. And there was immense variety of people in India. So Indian drama was looking upon the whole of India, the theoreticians of India, that is Bharat Muni, did not think of a region of India, but he looked upon the whole of India. And that is mentioned extensively in the Natya Shastra as to how people perform theater in different parts of the country and what they like, etc. That again goes on to prove that there was something like an all India theater tradition or all India performing tradition under which there were so many other smaller traditions which presented an immense amount of variety. So what does Bharat Muni have to say and how does he define? Now I'm going to read out to you a verse from the sixth chapter of the Natya Shastra, which summarizes the whole of Natya Shastra, which is uh, what is called a Sangraha, a collection of the essential concepts of Natya Shastra. And first I'll read this out, and then I'll explain it to you. And from there I'll expand and uh, tell you what are the fundamental concepts of uh, <clears throat> Natya Shastra regarding theatre. Here, before I go on to recite that verse, let me just add one thing. You see, in the Indian tradition, theatre includes poetry, it includes music, it includes dance, it includes uh, even acrobatics. It includes whatever is performed on the stage through sound and sight. Drishyam chashavyam, that which is seen and heard. So theater was defined as something which is seen and heard at the same time. And it is a unique art because in all other arts, either you see something or you hear something. You hear music, you see sculpture, you see painting. But in theater, you see and hear at the same time. So whatever is performed by human body, a single person or a group of people, whatever is performed in the performance area or the stage, is theater, is Natya. Natya is the action or the karma of Nat. And Nat means the performer. Don't go after the uh, very limited uh, 
word nut today. Today nut means an acrobat, but no. In Bharat Muni it meant the performer, the great performer, who is able to perform all kinds of things, old, new, and even look into the future genres and the future styles. So, what is theater? Now there are 11 things which are enumerated as the essential contents of theater or performance. The verse goes something like this. Rasa bhava hi abhinayaha dharmi vritti privittayaha siddhi swara tatha atodyam ganam rangascha sangraha so there is this collection the sangraha of 11 things rasa bhav abhinay dharmi vritti pravritti siddhi swara atodya gaan and rag so these are the 11 things now let me go through all these 11 but not in the same order as it has been stated not in the order of statement but so that you understand a few things more clearly and then we go on uh, to the finer things now the most obvious thing is rang or the performance space theater house theater house is an essential element of performance here the question arises what about an open theater or open space well there were open spaces in ancient time and one of the theatrical houses uh, mentioned in the Natya Shastra was most probably an entirely an open space, the triangular theater. But remember, a theater place doesn't have to be always an enclosed or a space which has a roof upon it. It does not have to be all the time a Natya Griha or a theater house. So anything which is designated and marked as the boundary where the performance is being done is theater space. There are two essential elements, the performer and the audience. So in that boundary, in that area where the performer acts and where the audience sees the performance, that whole thing is Ranga. Now, in ancient times, they had all kinds of Ranga. Here, a very obvious question arises. If there were theater houses, in ancient India, then why don't we have succeeded so far in excavating one? We have these hundreds and hundreds of uh, Greek theater called amphitheaters and they are all over Greece and neighboring countries and wherever the Greeks went, they made them. And we have them today in ruins or in good shape or repaired. But we don't have a single space which could be called a theater house from ancient times. Why? Well, the answer is not difficult to give. And the reason <coughs> is very obvious. Whereas the Greeks made their theater houses uh, not initially, but in the later stage of development, in stone, they have all survived. But in India, theater houses had to be built out of perishable material. That is out of grass, out of earth, out of bamboo, out of all kinds of things which are not going to last for very long. 
Number one, this was the reason. Number two, there was a tradition that a theater house is to be built for a particular performance. Just as a Yagya Shala <clears throat> is made for a particular Yagya, you don't make a Yagya Shala for all years to come. Now, of course, they are making them, but in ancient times or till very recent time, you always made a Yagya Shala or a Yagya home or a Yagya Graha only when you wanted to perform a Yagya. Similarly, a theater house was made in ancient India when a performance was to be held. So if a theater company has decided to come and people have decided to host him, or if some famous temple was going to hold a theater festival, then they would make a Natyagraha. And after the whole performance was over, the Natyagraha was pulled down. Now this still happens in another area of Hindu life. And what is that? That is marriage. You can all go and ask your parents to show you photographs and even maybe films on how they were married and the whole ceremony. But uh, there would be no Vivaha Mandap preserved in any house. Even today, when a proper Yagya is held or a Puja is held, they make a canopy which is only for the period of the ritual. So this is the primary reason why we do not discover, we are not able to discover, excavate or find out any kind of theater house. It was uh, very simple. So Ranga, <coughs> that is the theater house was an essential element. And why was it an essential element? Because in theater house, you can reserve the right for entering. You see, theater is a place where many things are said. And many things are said, which quite often some people don't like. And when they don't like, they can disturb a performance. Everybody doesn't like freedom of expression. And everybody doesn't like any kind of a criticism or a satire. So you need an enclosed space. And the Natya Shastra tells a story you can read in the first uh, chapter of the Natya Shastra story as to why this enclosed space where the right of entry was reserved was made and it was called the Natya Graha. Now, <clears throat> Ranga is one of the essential elements as I explained. Then the other elements which are of a finer nature were con also considered to be essential part of a theater performance. For instance, musical instruments. Musical instruments are given a very special status. Musical instruments are essential to any theater performance. And uh, <clears throat> there were four kinds of musical instruments. The strings, that is the harps, then the percussion, then the flute, and solid instruments. Uh, which like gamelian type of instruments, you know, you have gamelian in Indonesia today. So these were the instruments which were essential. If, mu if instruments are essential, if they are going to produce notes, swara and tala, then somebody is also going to sing to it. As a matter of fact, when 
Natya Shastra mentions the musical instruments of Atodya. This is an ancient word for it. Then in an instrument, they include the human body. So when you sing, it is through your throat, through your body you say. So your body is an instrument. It is called Gatravina. That's why they say, okay, essential thing is musical instrument, Atodya, as another element. So I am trying to go in the reverse direction, Ranga, then Atodya, then there is this element called Gaan. Now Gaan is a particular kind of song it is not just any song, but a particular kind of series of songs which were called Dhruvagans. Now Dhruva songs were very special in ancient performance. They disappeared sometimes in medieval times from Indian theater and they are not to be seen in any surviving form today. What were these Dhruvagans? Dhruvagans were songs which were sung on five occasions in theater. A song was sung before an actor made an entry. That was called Praveshaki Dhruva. Another song was sung before the actor was about to make an exit. A third kind of song was sung if somebody swooned on the stage. Fourth kind of song was sung if there was some very bad news or uh, a kind of news or an act which caused immense uh, constant uh, disturbance in the story. And then the fifth was a kind of soothing song to soothe your emotions. Now these songs were constantly used on these five occasions. What this indicates is that today we think of theater as an uninterrupted continuum of dialogue. We are used to theater as dialogue. One dialogue after another, one character speaking after another. But in classical Indian theater, this was not the case. As a matter of fact, dialogue came in, but along with dialogue, constantly there was music. There was group music, there was music along with dance, and there was a, what is now called background singing. So music played a very important role. And these Dhruva songs were part of the creation of the emotional experience of theater. So a song was sung on, let us say, the bright sun, if a great hero was about to enter if a great tapasvi or an ascetic was about to enter, then a song would be sung and there would be dance to it also. It was not just a song. It was a song sung and somebody would dance to it. And when this pada, when this song was sung with a particular meaning describing the sun, then you could anticipate the appearance of a great ascetic like Durvasa, Narad, or somebody. This was one of the conventions. So Dhruva Gan was an essential part of it. Swara. Swara does not mean only Sarigama Padhani. Swara means whatever was produced by the human uh, kantha or by the human voice. So whether it was the Vedic song, the Vedic notes, Udat Tanudat Swaret, 
whether it was the seven notes of music, whether it was the notes of the instrument, whether it was the particular intonation of the voice of the actor, everything was covered under the classification called Swara. So Swara, Atodya, Gaan and Rang. These are the four things that I have described to you so far. These are things easy to grasp because they are tangible things. Now I will come <coughs> to things which are very difficult to grasp because they are intangible. And so let us begin with the shloka. Rasa. Rasa bhava hi abhinaya. Rasa is the elevated experience that you feel and enjoy when you see theater. Every emotion, human emotion, which a person, he or she feels, is transformed into a very special experience in theater. You see, theater, and particularly Indian theater and classical Indian theater, aims at <clears throat> making you experience a transformation in your emotion. That is why even those emotions which are unpleasant in life, like painful emotions, like grief, or horror, they are enjoyed in theater. Nobody wants to see anything horrible in life, but you want to see horrible scenes in theater because that feeling of horror, which is bibhatsa and which is accompanied by fear, that is highly pleasurable. So you want to go to theater and you want to see Narasimha rip open the belly of the Rakshasa Hiranya Kashyapu and throw out the entrails. And you enjoy that scene in theater. So this capacity to transform what is horrible in life or what is very painful otherwise in life, something which is very piteous, full of pity, karuna, which you don't want to experience in yourself, in your life, that is something you enjoy in theater and you want to see that again and again. So it is this transformation of emotion and this transformation of emotion undergoes a sophistication, a universalization, and that is called rasa. Of course, uh, rasa is not something so easy to define as I have just given you an account of now. Uh, it's a very deep issue. And on my YouTube channel, you can see hours and hours of exposition as to what is rasa, who experiences rasa, whether it is the actor or the audience or both or the writer or the theater act or the uh, producer. So all these questions arise, but the essential thing is that the experience of your emotion, your ordinary emotion, that is transformed. So, why it is transformed, how it is transformed, those are very deep questions. And that calls for other detailed uh, examination and discussion. But this transformation of the emotional experience into rasa is the most essential feature of Indian theater. You want to go to theater to experience rasa. Natya Shastra says, Nahi rasadrite kashid arthaha pravartate. That is, nothing is 
full of any meaning unless there is a rasa in it. So if there is rasa, then you pursue watching or seeing something, a painting or a, a sculpture or you want to hear a piece of music if there is rasa in it. So you won't go to theater unless there is rasa in it. Because Nath Shastra admits the fact that nahi rasadrite kashchid arthaha pravartate. There is no meaning, there is no sense if there is no rasa. But how is it that rasa is created? Rasa, as I explained to you, is created by transformation of the emotion or bhava. Bhava does not mean just emotion. It also means all the thoughts that accompany an emotion. In the human uh, experience, there is a never a thought without a feeling and there is never a feeling without a thought. In English, there is no single word which uh, expresses both. But in uh, the Indian languages, Sanskrit has provided us with a word called bhava. So bhava means to be. So whenever I am being what I am, I am thinking and at the same time feeling. The two always go together in human experience. And it is the transformation of this bhava which becomes rasa. How is this communicated? How is bhava transformed into rasa communicated? It is communicated through abhinaya or acting. What is acting? Acting is not just movement made by the uh, player or the actor or the performer. No, acting is communicating the meaning. Yasmat prayogam nayate tasmat abhinayaha smritaha. That is, when performance or theater or the real thing is taken from the stage to the audience, that which takes, that agency which takes meaning from the stage to the audience, that is called Abhinaya. So, Yasmat Prayogam Nayate Tasmat Abhinaya Smrita. And how is this Abhinaya done? Abhinaya is done either through gestures, Angik, or through speech, or through clothing, and through an intense concentration on a particular given emotion. So there are four kinds of Abhinaya, the Natya Shastra defines them. Angik, which is through the body, you know, all jumping and dancing and uh, <clears throat> making all kinds of complicated dance movements, everything. Those are Angik Abhinaya. Vachik, speaking, singing, crying, making all kinds of noises, speaking all kinds of languages. So that is vachik abhine. Aharya, that is your dress, your costume, which again com communicates and transfers a meaning. And then finally sattvic, when an emotion is made very intense, and that intense emotion is communicated. So Angik, Vachik, Ahariya and Sattvik, these are the four Abhinayas and this makes up the first three reasons why, first three contents of Natya. Rasa, Bhavahi Abhinaya. We have done of course Ranga, we have done Gaan, Dhruva Gaan, and Swara and Atodya. So this makes seven. Then what are the other four? Now in theater, you know, there is a distinction between things which are seen only in the theater house. 
and things that come on the stage but they come from the world outside theater or what is called look or what is normally called in English life. So what is seen in life or what is seen in the world or loka and that which follows the discipline of loka is called loka dharma. So walking, eating, drinking, making love, noise, war, all this activity which is done by human beings is called loka dharma. And that is represented on the stage. A story which is either a love story or a war story or a story of some kind of plotting. That which is seen in our life is brought onto the stage and that is called Loka Dharma. Then there are things on stage which are not seen outside. So these very complicated movements of the hands, you know, the nritta hastas, khatka mukha, patak hasta, all of them, they are not seen in life because they are highly formalized languages of the theatrical expression. This is seen only on the stage. It's not seen outside. Or a very special way of walking, a very highly conventional way of dance-like movement. These are evolved as art forms for stage performance <coughs> only. And they follow the dharma, the nature of performance and therefore they are called natya dharma. So theater is always a combination of what is seen in life and what is represented on the stage as transformed into a theatrical language. This combination is a combination of Loka Dharmi and Natya Dharmi and the common word for them is Dharmi. So Bharat Muni says that theater Although it is an imitation of life, yet it is not a copy or a representation or a replica of life. It is life recreated in a different language, in a different method on the stage. So this is the dharmi. So rasa bhava hi abhinaya dharmi. Vritti. Now what is this Vritti? You see, Bharat Muni says that when you do a performance, when you use a particular genre, then there are certain things that you perform in that genre. For instance, let me take a familiar example. If you are going to enact a tragedy, then there will be very little laughter in there. You are not going to make jokes in a tragedy because if you increase the content of laughter or satire, then it is no longer a tragedy. A tragedy has to be full of pathos. It has to be full of serious ideas and there has to be a lot of grief and pity. Aristotle, of course, made it clear, a combination of horror and pity, right? Pathos and Helios, those two combine to make uh, tragedy. Dharmi was a concept which was developed in India in order to further redefine as to what are the kinds of emotions that will be used on the stage. And they would be done according to different genres of a play. Whereas in the Greek tradition, there are broadly speaking only three genres, tragedy, comedy, and satyricon. Whereas in the Indian tradition, there were 10 genres. Some genres which represent the life of kings or life of well-to-do people, 
subgenres which are full of satire, vulgar satire or sophisticated satire, some genres which are about uh, city life. So in all in all, there were 10 genres or Dasha Rupaka. I don't have time to <laughs> give you an account of them. In order to represent those genres, you chose certain emotions. And that was called Vritti. So if there was a romantic play, then there would be a lot of song and music and dance and humor and similar uh, emotions which would make uh, the play, the love play or a comic play successful. And if it was a play of conflict or of grief or of death, then you would have pathos, you would have uh, many kinds of emotions which invoke horror or which invoke pity. So this method of choosing emotions and how much for a particular genre, this was called uh, Vritti. Now India was a huge country. So Bharat Muni said that you must keep in mind <clears throat> the tastes of different parts of uh, India. People in the south like a lot of song and dance so when you go there perform a bit more of that. If you go to the east of India then make your plays a bit rhetorical. If you go to the north let there be more of fighting in it because people by and large are of a combative nature in North India. If you go in Western India, then have a combination of all these. So that was called Privitti. These were some of the essential directions, directives, which were laid down. So Rasa Bhava Hi Abhinaya Dharmi Vritti Privittaya. These are the six elements which were given. Another very relevant thing which Bharat Muni calls as an essential feature of theater is success or Siddhi. He says that you must try to evaluate yourself and find out if your play has been a success or not. If there has been Siddhi so people will reward you, they will clap, they will welcome you, they will offer you garlands, they'll give you prizes and all that. If you have made a horrible performance, then they'll, you know, <coughs> throw stones at you or they will shout, or they'll boo you out. So you will know whether you succeeded or not. Now it is easy to know if you succeeded with your earthly audience. But Natya was supposed to be performed not just for the earthly audience, but for the gods as well. And therefore they said that you must please the gods. But how would you know that gods are pleased? Because gods are not going to come down and give you a certificate. So how would you know that the gods have been pleased. Bharat Muni prescribes that if after a performance your audience is stunned, if they have not, nothing like any clapping or making any sound, if they are full of awe and wonder, then you should think that the gods are pleased. So Siddhi is of two kinds, divine Siddhi, when the gods are pleased and when men and women are pleased. Bharat Muni says that you should aim to please the gods and men all together. So Rasa Bhava Hi Abhinaya Dharmi Vritti Pravittaya Siddhi Success 
and swara we talked about atodya the musical instrument particular kind of songs dhruva songs dhruva gaan and finally the theater now these are the 11 things that make up what is essentially theater you can see here that in this classification the emphasis is on performance they are not <coughs> foregrounding story or mythos not that they don't describe what is a story there is a whole chapter uh, in natya shastra which talks about the plot or the story and the kinds of plots and the subplots and uh, what are the essential features of what is called iti vritta but they make it all that as part of the spoken reality or swara for them it is swara and it is also performance or it is also dance so gesture speech everything would fall somewhere or the other in these 11 elements and that would make up the essential features of theater because theater is considered here primarily as something which is to be heard and seen which is a performance it is of course something that contains a story it is something which talks about a character or presents a character before you obviously enacting the story of rama and enacting the stories of from mahabharat and various puranas they are the essential uh, content of indian theater traditional theater and all those characters are there but those characters will communicate through very practical means of performance and therefore when they go on to define theater they talk they foreground the means of performance and therefore these 11 classification so if there are these 11 things in theater theater would be a successful art if they are not there then it will not be as you can see that all these things will change with time the stage will change with time even the audience will change in time uh various conditions of performance will change like there is no performance under candle light or under uh, some kind of uh, you know flame lights any more it's all very modern however these 11 things will stay as they are which does not mean the dhruva songs will stay and be performed as they were performed earlier no you would perform songs all right you would bring in songs at various junctures in a theatrical story unless you do that your story will not be a success so the biggest testimony to bharat muni's vision is the modern indian film the modern indian film in uh, whatsoever language tamil hindi bengali marathi they all need music they all need songs and for those who are raised in the west very often those songs are like interpolations which can be just thrown out but for the indian audience they do not consist of something as extraneous they are essential so an essential song a strong is something <coughs> which takes the story forward and this combination of dance and music and gesture and dialogue rendered not realistically but unrealistically all this wonderful combination 
consist of what we may call the tradition of Indian Natya. So thank you very much. This was my lecture. Now I would like to invite questions from you. Please ask me questions. I would like to give answers to as many questions as possible. Uh, make your question very brief. I want questions. I don't want observations. Uh, and I would like to give an answer explaining various things that have come up in your mind. And I think that would be more fruitful instead of my just going on talking one way. So please. Good afternoon, sir. Yes. Uh, according to Bharata's Natya Shastra, there is Loko Dharmi Natya huh. and uh, Natya Dharmi Natya. Yes. Uh, found also Mukta Mantra also there. What is Mukta Mantra, sir? Mukta Mantra? Yes, sir. Well, I have not uh, read any such term in Natya Shastra or later tradition of Mukta Mantra. I, you know, the Mukta Mantra. Mancha, mancha, huh? Sir. Huh? Mukta Mantra. Oh, Mukta Mantra. Okay. No, 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 no. Just a minute. Mukta Mantra is a, is a neologism. It's a modern terminology of open theater. You see, we are calling it open, what we call open theater has been translated into Indian languages as Mukta Mancha or open theater. I told you during the course of my talk that there were various kinds of theater houses in ancient India. And this open space was always available, but uh, a theater house without a canopy was not very often available or was not part of the Natyagraha. This does not mean that there was no open theater because there were so many spaces in which theater was performed where there would be no big, big uh, covering or ceiling which would contain all the audience on doors and the walls. For instance, temples uh, very often held uh, festivals, theater festivals, and they would be done in the temple courtyard. There would be some kinds of dances which would be done in the Natya Mandapa. But when, when thousands of people have to see a performance, then they would be sitting in the open space. So, you see, essentially, what is Ranga? Ranga is that performance area. Once that performance area is chalked out, then that becomes your limited space in which you act and around which or in front of which you sit and watch. You understand? Yeah. <clears throat> so more questions, please. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Yes. Uh, I wanted to know about the uh, 108 uh, postures of Shiva in Tandava. Oh. Uh, I've heard that uh, they, like, they have developed 100, 108 uh, Karanas, if I'm not wrong, it's called. That's so right. Can some light on history on when it was done and and why is it not practiced today? Or if it is, so where, where can we see it and all? All right. Now, your question is where can you see 108 Karanas? I don't know if you can see 108 Karanas in performance anywhere today. Like so many, many things which were done in ancient times, like Sthitapathya, like uh, various kinds of Sattvic Abhinay, they have been lost. But you still see uh, 
a large number of karanas, maybe 50 to 60 karanas, still in the classical dance forms. So in Odissi, in Bharatanatyam, uh, you would be able to see those karanas. Now, what is a karana? Karana is a combination of the way in which you hold your hands and your feet together. This is the definition of Karana. Holding your hands in a particular position and combining the, that way of holding the hands with the way of keeping your legs. So Hastapad Sama Yoga a particular position in which the hands are shown and combining with that a given position of the feet. That is a karana. Basically, this is what may be called the alphabet of dance. You know, just as you have alphabet, kakha, ga, ga, varnamala. These are some of the fundamental postures which make up the dance movements. By themselves, they don't communicate anything. Just as a Varnamala is something which transforms into a language, into a speech. But Kakha Ga Gha, this is not language. They are a classification of sounds. Similarly, karanas are a classification of postures. But these postures, when they are combined, then they become dance movements. So two or three or four karanas combined to make uh, <clears throat> one movement. These movements combined to make an angahara. And these angaharas are combined with various ways of holding and moving your hands or moving your belly or moving your neck. So this movement of neck or just the belly or hands is called rechaka. These are the various constituents of Natya. And this is still preserved very beautifully. Uh, I would say almost 70 to 80 percent of the art form is still preserved in Indian dance. So if you go to see Indian dance, Bharatanatyam, you would see this. You would see the hand positions, you would see the body position. This is Karana in action. Now as alphabets or as a Varnamala of dance, the Karanas were also engraved on uh, some temple walls in various places in the temples. And uh, it seems that from 7th century, 8th century onwards, uh, they were done in India and outside India, uh, wherever there was an impact of Indian dance. So <clears throat> in today's Cambodia, Indonesia, etc., there are temples where the Karanas were engraved and you can see them as sculptures. But this is the language of dance and it is still preserved and you can see them in dance. Now when you are seeing a dance, then in order to figure out what is that Karana, you would have to undergo a special study and maybe do a bit of dance yourself, isn't it? <laughs> so this is how you can learn about it. Does that satisfy you? in any way <laughs> i hope it does yes the gentleman who raised his hand yes okay, please sir, can I ask? yes okay sir <clears throat> dance and the nartikala also has a certain context earlier we used to have the rajas we used to have the temples dance and all that but now the yeah. world has changed so uh -huh. whether nartikala also need to change and also, since we have a Shastra around the Natya, mm -hmm. they still were not able to make a big mark in the world because you see the Oscars of the world, they do not come to India. So what is really happening around and how can 
We talk about India as a Vishwa Guru, but what is the future? What we should be doing now? Because I am not very impressed that Ham Sahib ye the. Hame to see what we are and what we can do. Yes. So, you can put a prakash in this vishay. Thank you. You know, uh, <coughs> you have asked me a question about Oscars. You have asked me a question about uh, a prize or a recognition given by uh, about American, European uh, film world. And why don't they give Oscars to India? Now, my answer to you is that I'm very glad that they don't give Oscars to India. And I don't want a single damn Oscar for any Indian artist. Because I don't want a patronization of definition of art as seen in Hollywood. Because that would make, as it has made, Indian film industry into Bollywood. There was a time when Indian film industry was making very beautiful, socially meaningful, inspiring films for Indians and even for people outside India. <coughs> you know, you go to Russia, they still talk about Nargis and Raj Kapoor. You go to Turkey, they still talk about Indian films of 40s and 50 and the great music. And in Turkey, they made a Turkish version of Avara. If you see a bit of history of 20th century, the whole of the Western world acquired innovation by seeing the visual and the performing arts of India, nowhere else. You see, great movements like Dada, great movements like Surrealism, they all came to the minds of these artists after seeing African and Asian art. Now, you see, your question is concentrated about the approval of the modern European and American business interest and definitions of what is a film and what is theater and what is theatrical form. But India will never get an approval because India is not going to make any film which would satisfy Hollywood. And why should India make a film? India should make a film which is in their own tradition which is something which is for the Indian people and which continues with the art forms of India. That is what people in the West also, the perceiving people, the innovative people would watch. I don't know how much you are aware of the great impact that Indian music had in 40s, 50s, 60s and 70s in North America. The whole counterculture movement and freedom of Western music from uh, European white music to include the whole multiplicity and diversity of American life based on their music was inspired by India. It was Pandit Ravi Shankar and Ali Akbar and great performers of India and dancers who transformed their music and transformed their what is called uh, popular music. This popular music did not exist before uh, 1960. It started with Beatles. So I think if we uh, <coughs> correct our perspective and if we acquire a greater faith 
in our capacity to innovate, then we would not only please our people, but we will please people all over the world. And this is something which we have already done. You see, Indian films, Indian dance forms, Indian art forms, they are appreciated all over Africa, all over Middle East, all over Russia and the erstwhile Soviet Union countries. There is a massive appreciation of it. So I think modernity should not be defined in terms of what is happening in Hollywood or let us say in some uh, in some uh, areas of, of uh, commercial uh, performances in America. And uh, you would be happy to know that since, uh, since, 30, uh, since uh, 70s and 80s, in the theater arts, there have been a large number of people who have brought new kind of theater in the West. People like Richard Schechner, Eugen Oparpa, Grotowski. Where did they all learn from? They learned from India. Richard Schechner came to India and saw the uh, Ramlila of Banaras and he developed what is called uh, uh, environmental theater, the theory of environment. Grotowski, he came, poor man's theater, Yugeno Barba. All these people were inspired by, primarily by Indian arts. So we have already done a massive impact. And I think it is through our art forms, our traditional art forms, that we can really transform the world again. And first we can transform ourselves. That's my answer. Be sure, sir. Thank you. And uh, I just want to add one small thing that yeah. wherever there is a fusion and wherever there is a new technology, like you see the RRR movie, it oh. is creating a big impact in the West. Like they were first released on Netflix. Now there was a demand that released in the theaters. So wherever there is a somewhat of modernization no, no, of what Indian thing. Uh, just one minute, just one minute. Let us not confuse between art form and technology. You see technology, whether it is a mobile phone <clears throat> or it is some kind of a distribution channel like OTT and all these things, Netflix, etc. They are pure technology. They are not art forms. They are selling your art, whether it is Indian art or uh, African art or other art. They are popular for very different reasons. Let us keep our mind on what is proper art, <clears throat> on what is Vidya, on what is the real method of creating a rasa, not mass consumption. You see, you have to think about creating something beautiful, not about earning money, not about using art for popularity. Because whenever you give up quality for quantity, then art itself becomes diminished and something else takes over. So if you are going to make Banaras into a tourist place, then Banaras very slowly will become uh, a, into a commercial center, but it will no longer be a divine city. If all Hindu temples are going to be transformed into great tourist destination, then they would all become museums. They would not be Hindu temples. There would be something like uh, what you have in Indonesia, the island of Bali, which earns a lot of money on it, on its Hindu face. But it is not 
Of course, it is a living tradition there, but people just go to watch it. So I am talking of <clears throat> reviving tradition for present needs here. For recreating in and recreating and refurbishing our present day Natya in India, in different languages of India. Natya in ancient times was also multilingual. Unfortunately, we have started calling it Sanskrit Natya. And some of the famous pundits of India have designated it as ancient Indian theatre, as Sanskrit theatre. This was something which was begun by the Europeans as classical theatre, Sanskrit theatre. And then it was continued by Sanskritists of modern times. But ancient Indian theatre was a multilingual theatre. It Every play used to have six to seven languages. Sanskrit was only 10% or 5%. So a great revival has to take place in India, in Indian art, specifically in Indian theater. And that will be on ground. Our mind should concentrate on creating something here for our people. If something beautiful comes up, then we will enjoy it and the rest of the world will also enjoy it. I, I have a very different view, but this is my view anyway. Yes, please. Any other question? Uh, we are grateful to you, sir. Yeah. for this impressive and enlightening talk. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Well, I'm delighted that I had this opportunity given to me and I would end up by saying that I have nearly 200 hours or 250 hours almost of uh, uh, videos on theater, particularly on Natya Shastra on my channel, YouTube channel and you can go and watch them and almost every detail has been thrashed out and detailed there. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Dhanyavad. Uh, with this, uh, we are closing the session. Yes. And uh, thank you, sir. Now we are closing the session. Yes, thank you very much.